Good morning, everyone. Welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. Uh, my name is Keith Benny. I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Learning here at TIFF. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's higher learning event, our masterclass with the incredible Mimi Valdez. Uh, could we give it up for Mimi? <laughs> Uh, to begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Mississaugas of New Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat, the original keepers of this land, for hosting us uh, here at TIFF today and hosting us uh, here at TIFF on their land every day. On behalf of TIFF, I'd also like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. As a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our members and donors for supporting TIFF's uh, year-round programming, making our educational events here possible. Um, a few reminders, we ask that you please place your phones on silent. Uh, during the Q&A, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our guests on stage. We just ask that you please wait for a microphone to reach you so everyone can hear your question. Um, we have another event in our higher learning season on November 17th. Uh, we're presenting a panel in collaboration with the Ontario College of Trades, focusing on careers in the film industry. Um, so our panelists include a chef, a mobile crane operator, and a power technician who will discuss their training and, and how they uh, work and collaborate in the film and television industry. So we invite you to come out on November 17th. Um, this morning's event is presented in partnership, our uh, long-standing partnership now with the Registered Graphic Designers of Ontario, RGD, as part of their annual conference, Design Thinkers. Uh, and so we'd like to extend a big thank you to uh, RGD for their collaboration on this event. We've been really thrilled and honoured to work with them for five or six years now to bring a creative thinker here to Toronto, both for the conference as well as the TIFF Higher Learning Program. So big thank you to RGD. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Stussy Shuden from uh, RGD, who's the president, uh, to provide a welcome on behalf uh, of RGD. Susie. Thanks, Keith. Um, yes, as Keith mentioned, my name is Susie Tudin. I'm also a principal of Forge Media and Design here in Toronto and currently president of the association, uh, RGD. Um, we're very fortunate at RGD to have this ongoing partnership with TIFF. Uh, it's been six years, actually, <laughs> that we now have the co collaboration going on uh, to bring leading designers from the film industry to Toronto. Uh, a little bit about RGD. Through RGD, Canadian designers exchange ideas, educate and inspire, set professional standards and build a strong, supportive community dedicated to advocating for the value of design. Our programming includes a biannual salary survey, RGD certification for graphic designers who qualify, our handbook on the business of graphic design, and a conference that we organize called Design Thinkers, as Keith mentioned. Uh, for more on all this, you can go to rgd.ca, uh, our website. Uh, today's presenter, Mimi Valdez, is one of more than 30 visionary designers who spoke at the Sony Center over the last two days at our 19th uh, annual Design Thinker conference. Uh, other speakers included the VP of Design for CNN, Pentagram partner Emily Oberman, who has designed the opening credits for Saturday Night Live for more than 15 years, and Emmy Award-winning designer Chris Doe, founder of Blind Inc. Our next design thinkers will take place in Vancouver, May 29 and 30. And if you're interested to find more about it, please visit designthinkers.com for details. Thank you. Thank you, Stussy. Um, that's all the official business we have for you off the top. Um, we're so thrilled to have, have Mimi with us here today. As you'll soon learn, she's an inspiring creative force, and, and we're so very lucky that she's applying that creative energy to works on the big screen. Um, we're also thrilled today to have Amanda Paris lead the conversation uh, with Mimi. Uh, Amanda is a host of the weekly art series Exhibitionists on CBC Television and CBC Radio's R&B show Marvin's Room. Uh, she also writes a weekly column for CBC Arts. In her spare time, I'm not sure how much of that there is, um, uh, Amanda also writes theatre plays. Uh, she recently wrapped the critically acclaimed and sold out run of her play Other Side of the Game. Descended from Grenadadian and uh, Venezuelan ancestry, Paris was born in London, England, and raised on the south side of Jane Street here in Toronto. Over the course of her career, Paris has worked at the multi-award-winning arts incubator The Remix Project, and she is the co-founder of the alternative education organization Lost Lyrics. She also co-created the Ride or Die Project, a multi-platform initiative that produces creative content inspired by the stories of women that support loved ones who are incarcerated. 
Paris completed her MA degree in the Sociology of Education uh, Department at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. Her curriculum work was published in Rhymes to Re-Education, the first ever hip-hop education resource guide created by the Ontario Ministry of Education. So you're in incredible hands today to uh, uh, learn from our guests on stage. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, our host for today, Amanda Paris. carrying too many things. Thank you all for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Mimi Valdez. For more than 20 years, award-winning multi-hyphenate, and I mean multi-hyphenate, she's chief creative officer, writer, editor, producer, speaker. Mimi Valdez has changed the way the world consumes pop culture. Mimi's background in journalism, she's a former editor-in-chief of Vibe and Latina magazines, provides a roadmap for each project she works on. Whether influencing the creation of the groundbreaking 24-hour music video Happy, co-producing Sundance Film Festival and Cannes Film Festival indie darling Dope, serving as an executive producer on the Oscar-nominated film Hidden Figures, or overseeing creative uh, or overseeing the creative for Pharrell Williams' company, I Am Other, she produces content with a lasting impact. Regardless of the medium, venue, or audience, Mimi's message stays true to her core belief that storytelling should entertain, educate, and inspire humanity. A passion to influence the next generation of storytellers is reflective in all that Mimi does. She's a proud alumna of New York University's prestigious journalism program, a native New Yorker. She resides in Brooklyn, New York with her husband. With her husband. Please join me in welcoming Mimi Valdez to the stage. Over here, okay. Hi. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we're on now. Yes, okay, wonderful. So I am super excited about this conversation. Oh, I don't you. want you to be creeped out, but I have been stalking your life for the past three <laughs> oh days. <laughs> I know all about your Instagram. <laughs> so I'd love to start our conversation off with talking about this core that you seem to think talk about and mention a lot, which is the idea of storytelling. Have you always been a storyteller? I think so. I don't think I realized it at first. Um, I'm an only child, and as an Same. only child, you um, you have a wild imagination, and you start making up stories to pass the time and not be bored. But I don't think it was until I got to probably, I guess, high school that I realized that I was a storyteller, just because English was one of my best subjects, and I had really great teachers who sort of encouraged the fact that I could write. So I think that's when it started to kind of come together for me, but I think it took a minute. Mm -hmm. What do you think, was there anything specific that you think inspired your love of stories beyond being an only child? Was there something in your life that you think propelled you into this, this hmm. love? I think it was a couple of things. I spent a lot of time watching television, <laughs> as one would do um, as a kid, reading a lot, and I think it was a combination of things. With television, I was really intrigued by the characters I saw on TV because they were so different from the people that I grew up with or lived in lived in my building. I lived in low-income housing um, in the projects in New York City. So that was sort of intriguing to me um, who these people were because I, well, some of them obviously like make-believe kind of characters, like let's say a Bewitched or, you know, um, Adam's Family or any of that kind of stuff. But like the Brady Bunch, um, I remember thinking that their house that they lived in was make-believe. I did not know that people actually lived in houses like that. So I think it was a combination of just like being, um, whether it was television characters or, or just people in general. I think people fascinate me. I love just hearing people's stories, people that whether they're similar to me or, or they're not similar to me, I just, I'm just intrigued by people in general. And I think that's what sort of sparked my interest in wanting to tell people's stories, whether it was people that maybe I didn't see in the mainstream or didn't see reflected that I thought were amazing. Like hip hop is a good example of that. I was fascinated with the music and the culture, but I didn't see it on, well, you know, this is like the 70s and 80s, so I didn't see it. Um, on television or in magazines. Um, so I think for me, that probably was one of the first things that I was like, oh, like, these stories need to be told, right? You know? Mm -hmm. When do you think you realized that that passion for stories and storytelling and people uh, could be translated into a career? 
That took a minute. Um, I remember there used to be this public access um, show on um, in New York called Video Music Box. It was the first time that we saw hip hop music um, videos being played and Ralph McDaniels, the, the VJ, um, he would do these interviews with different hip hop artists. So that's how I learned about them. And then I saw uh, Spin Magazine did, Harry Allen did a story on, um, and actually I didn't see, even see it in Spin Magazine. I saw it on the, Salt and Pepper's second album on the back cover, they ran an excerpt from the Spin Magazine story by Harry Allen. And that was when, honestly, it clicked that I was like, oh, you can write about this music? Because again, remember, I'm in high school. It's, I figured out that I am a writer, that this is you know something I can do. But I didn't put together that, oh, wait, you can actually interview hip hop artists. And this is like a real thing. This is a career. Mm -hmm. So I think it wasn't until I saw those things that my wheels started turning. But again, it wasn't very clear to me that that was necessarily gonna be a job for me. It was still just a hobby. Um, but I start, started seeing little inklings of it. And then really it was, into, uh, to be honest, until I, um, Vibe Magazine did a test issue my last semester at NYU. And I remember when I saw that magazine, I was like, this is it, this is everything. This is like the music and it's culture and it was fashion. and film, but it was all through this lens of urban music and culture. And that was when I was like, oh, I, I need to work here. Like somehow I got to figure this out. I got to, I got to, got to work here. So I want to talk more about that vibe experience. But before we get there, I love that you've said that you were a fan before anything else. You're a fan of hip hop absolutely, culture. Yeah. And also that being a fan at when you were growing up also made you an outsider oh, as well. Absolutely. Too. I would be made fun of. <laughs> now it's so funny to think like hip hop has become obviously such a global phenomenon. And it's like, nothing now but growing up i would be made fun of you know, a lot of times for listening to mu music i mean a lot of i had there was a lot of us that did but there were just as many people and that i grew up with in in my classroom that thought it was the worst thing ever and that it was you know not real music and you know just had all these sort of horrible things to say about something that i felt so connected to partly because i think the artists making the music looked like the people who lived in my building or look like people from my neighborhood and I sort of could relate to them on that level and I thought what they were doing was art and was something really valid and should be celebrated but meanwhile not only in my daily life I was being made fun of for being a fan but also I just didn't see their artistry you know sort of being celebrated anywhere. Can you talk a little bit about how much, because I mean, I think a lot of creators and creatives talk about um, you know, inspiration in different ways, but I don't know if a lot of uh, conversation goes to how important being a fan of a culture is. Can you talk a little bit about how much, how important being a fan of hip hop culture has shaped your career and your yeah, trajectory? Yeah, and, and it goes beyond, I think, when you, when you become obsessed with something, right? When you really enjoy something, you become a fan. But I think what really takes it to the next level is your hunger so to speak, for just feeding your curiosity about it, like really getting like diving in deep and trying to learn as much as you can. Because I think when you become, whether a super fan or, or just sort of um, obsessed with feeding your curiosity about a certain subject in a certain way, it, it helps you just, you know, I say this all the time, staying curious helps you evolve. It like helps you sort of know what's important to you, what you like, what you're, what, what you're into. Um, doing that kind of research about something is really important. And I think that is what helped me, well, obviously it led me to my first job because having that, that expertise was, really came in handy. But it also taught me a lot about like, just again, just staying curious, making sure that you, know, you find something and you learn everything you can about it. You just dive deep in and, and try to analyze it and research it from all angles because I do think that those things are just important um, skills to have in anything that you do. Would that be an example of one of the transferable skills that you've had that has enabled you to have so many different Absolutely. kinds of Absolutely, I, I like to, I say this a lot, I, I like to think of myself as um, forever a student, you know, someone that uh, is just constantly trying to learn as much as possible about everything, you know, whether it's about people, things, play, what, whatever it is, because I think that's what helps me kind of whether it's it leads me to the next project or just helps me with whatever I'm doing. And I like to work with people who, who think the same way. I mean, Pharrell and I were producing partners for, well, we were friends first before we started working together, but you know, that same sort of um, 
we're just intrigued by the things that we don't know, you know, like that. Uh, I think a lot of times, a lot of, I find a lot of people usually stay comfortable within their worlds or, well, I'm this and this is what I do. And I, again, I think it's really important to know everything you can about whatever profession or your, your um, sort of main thing, but to have that insight and have an understanding of just different worlds, I think can, can uh, really inform what it is that you do on a daily basis. Okay, so let's talk about this first career in the magazine industry. I know that you said you grown up, when you grew, were growing up, you were obsessed with magazines, but you didn't necessarily see yourself having a career in them. Can you talk a little bit about your journey to finally realizing this is something that you could do and this is something that you could pursue? Yeah, so absolutely obsessed with magazines, painted, you know, showed a whole world that was just foreign to me. Like, I was like, does what is this, right? Like, what, what, like whether looking at my mom's Vogue magazines and learning about art and photography and, you know, seeing pictures of fashion shoots in like, you know, foreign locales, like all of that I was obsessed with. And then, but again, not really realizing that I could necessarily have a job in it. Um, then got to high school, you know, did well in, in writing and sort of kind of enjoyed that, um, you know, was editor in chief of my school newspaper. But it was really my next door neighbor who um, I was always at her house all the time. I used to babysit uh, uh, her kids. And she was the one that kind of made me realize that it could be a job. Because she was like, you like magazines. You like all that. And I was like, yeah. And she was like, you know, you'd, you'd be good at that. Like, you should work at a magazine. And I just, I, I literally remember the moment being like, I should work at a magazine. Like, huh, OK. Like, because again, I didn't know anybody who worked at magazines. So of course. She put that thought in my head, which is why it's so important to when we see young kids or, or whoever, even an, an adult who has an interest in something, it's so important that we as humans should like encourage people because it was really that one little thing that she said to me made me go, oh, I, I could work at a magazine. And then I started like obsessing and really looking at magazines in a different way. I noticed that the address that was in all the magazines were all in New York. So I was like, oh. The mag, the, of course I'm gonna get a job in a magazine. Like they're here, they're in New York. And like literally, I remember the Condé Nast building, the Hearst building, I would like walk outside and like kind of just look at the building and be like, okay, it's here, okay, got it. Like, you know, and, and for me, and again, it was maybe that naiveness of, you know, you start kind of reading, 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 paying attention and, and, and you know, finding out like, oh, people come from all over the world, you know, to New York to work in the magazine industry. I live here. so. Of of course, I'm going to get a job at a magazine, right? It was just that that silliness. But again, I think you know that that naive um, sort of mentality helped me a lot in the, in that in that way. But yeah, it was really that little spark of a nugget that a, a neighbor said to me. So you were part of the founding kind of crew that helped to build Vibe magazine from the ground, from the very first yeah. issue. Um, can you talk a, to a little bit about those early days, what it was like to be a part of a team that built something that was such okay. a huge legacy? So it was so fun. <laughs> it was, and and even though, obviously now looking back 20 years, like you, you're like, gosh, like that was so crazy. But I will be honest, at the time, we also knew it was crazy. Like we felt the energy of, that this was important work that, because again, most of us, we were all fans. We all loved the music and the culture so much and we wanted to see it celebrated and to see it recognized and see these artists being looked at as artists. So we were just like, we were excited. I mean, and in some ways I think, um, you know, we were journalists, but we were such fans that I think sometimes maybe we we also, I guess in some ways, you know, a real journal or, or, or pure journalist might have accused us of maybe being fans a little bit too much because there was this responsibility I think we all felt to like protect it and to make sure that these artists were um, that, that they were just celebrated in the right way and even and that could you know to be honest that even kind of came to that could even be reflected in ways where. This was new for everybody. Like these artists had no idea, had no, there was no media training. They didn't know how to act <laughs> in front of journalists. So a lot of times you'd see someone be like, mm, okay, I'm not gonna write about that because that wouldn't be good. You know, but so like I said, sometimes the lines were blurred. Um, you know, whether someone may look back and be like, oh, you guys maybe, you know, didn't, should have done this or shouldn't have done that, maybe. But, but I think it was kind of necessary in those early days because we, we all had a very common, um, interest in just making sure that the 
just that the art was celebrated. That was our only goal. And when it started happening, we felt really, really excited. Like we felt like we were part of something bigger. When you became editor-in-chief at Vibe magazine, you started putting, a, well not started, I'm sure that the magazine did this a little bit before, but you consciously made an effort to put sort of up-and-comers on no, the covers absolutely. of the No, magazine. actually, we hadn't oh, before. Oh, you hadn't? No, okay. not really, no. Um, that was a very conscious decision on my part because I felt that by 2003, now the world was all about hip hop, mm -hmm. right? Like now it was really becoming this global phenomenon and Unlike before, where with the established artists, we'd make a phone call and be like, hey, we want to put someone on the cover. Sure, no problem. What date? Da, 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 da. Now it was like, well, we have an offer from Rolling Stone. We have an offer from Time. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So it was frustrating. It's like but the pros and cons yeah, of Yeah, the pros and cons of like, it's like, we were here first, you know, but nobody cared, right? Like, and now, of course, that's the, it's like, in some ways, if I'm, if I was an editor in chief of Vibe, I'd be like, "Wow, that's awesome!" So and so, you know, Usher's getting a you know cover with Rolling Stone. Like, that's that's cool. That means that the music is is reaching more people. But I was upset. Like that Usher was a, was a great example where it was like they lied to us, and they ended up being on the cover of Rolling Stone and us at the same time, which you never wanted to happen. Everyone was supposed to have the exclusive. But um, in any case, I I made the point to make sure partly to distinguish ourselves um, from sort of the competition, also to show all these other magazines that we indeed um, had the most credibility when it came to this culture. And because I was like, okay, you guys don't have um, the foresight to know who the next people, they're just responding to charts, right? They're just responding to what's popular. So we made it a point, you know, out of the 10 cover, we did, yeah, 10 covers a year, so maybe three of them we would devote to up and coming artists that we felt were gonna make an impact, we're gonna sell millions of records. But you know, you work on magazines three to four months ahead of time, so you're really just going by gut. You're really like, okay, I think so and so is gonna be good. I mean, Chris Brown is probably one of our best examples that you know we put him on the cover before his first, right when his first album was about to, to come out. Um, T.I. is another one. Uh, but yeah, but it was, it was fun to do, but also very scary, because I was like, I hope this works. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like it seems like it's a guiding ethos of yours as well, too, to look for not only the people that are established, but also those that are up and coming, and to do that through the gut instinct. Yeah, Can you that, talk a little bit about that? That's just so fun. To me, Like the idea of discovering new talent or discovering, um, and I hate even using the word discover, right? Because these people existed <laughs> before you, we, find, we find them. But the idea of giving someone an opportunity to shine in that way, to really give them the platform, that's really exciting to me. I, I get a lot of joy out of knowing that we were the first to you know, support someone in, in that way, only just because I feel like I don't know, it's just really personally gratifying um, to me. I don't like, I don't like doing everything that everyone else does. Like that's boring to me, it's not, it's not exciting. And part, to be honest too, is like, I also feel like it's our responsibility when we are in these quote unquote positions of power that to use them for, for good and use them for the next generation and, and, and to, to lend that kind of support. I just, I just think that's important to do and it was, you know, it's not um, it's not always easy because again, like you have you you have to make the right decision, right? Like you hope, like okay, I hope I think this person's gonna be a star. I think this person's gonna. Is there an do example where you made, a, like it didn't go well <laughs> that you can think of? No, not not necessarily. Not, no, no one that that's like glaring that I could think of. Let me keep thinking. Let me see if I'll come back to that. If anyone comes to mind, but I'm sure probably at Blaze, we at Vibe had started a pure hip hop magazine called Blaze. And because Double XL and the sources existed existed at the time, that that magazine, that's all I did was put new artists on the cover. So I'm sure looking back at some of those, they might have had some success, but then they, you know, they went away. They didn't necessarily uh, have the kind of longevity. Can you talk? Because I mean, I think that idea of having the credibility to know what's fresh and what's popping is like really interesting for anybody, no matter what field they're in. I mean, at the time when you were there, maybe there was one strategy that you used, and today there's a different one, but can you talk a little bit about the tangible ways that you do try to stay connected to what is happening and what is interesting? I think the biggest thing that I do, and I make sure anyone that works with me does, is just is to live, as s simple as that sounds, but 
you know, at the magazine before I became editor in chief, we used to be there till like one o'clock in the morning, right? And I used to be like, all right, now we're gonna get this together because I need everybody to leave here, like come in at six, work really hard and leave at six o'clock, like go live, go to concerts, go to museums, go to a Broadway play, go just be out there, you know, talking to people, um, take a trip, like take your vacation, don't take your vacation. Because I really think that if you're working all the time, you're in a bubble, right? That's probably one of my biggest problems with Hollywood, right? I feel like a lot of the executives, they live in a bubble. Like when you don't live and like make sure that your circle is not only, if, you, if your immediate circle isn't diverse, but your life should be diverse. You should find the things, um, you know, find different things to do, whether it's like once a month doing something like, okay, I would never go, I don't know, horseback ride, whatever it, whatever it is, but like just go and do something you wouldn't necessarily do. That to me is the, biggest thing that anyone can do when it comes to trying to do your best work is just to live, like is not to spend all your time working because I just don't think it, I don't think it's helpful. So you were editor in chief of this magazine at this time in hip hop culture that a lot of other women who were maybe in the publication world at that time have since talked about all the difficulties that they dealt with de during that time, dealing with the misogyny in the culture, dealing with a lot of the sexism that they had to address day to day and that kind of became normalized. Were there any, what, how did you balance and how did you deal with the day to day issues of being a woman in a very male dominated culture so and industry? crazy is that I honestly didn't really have any real issues and problems coming up because here's here's why when I, I started at Vibe as an editorial assistant and I was hip-hop girl everybody in the industry knew that I was the expert there I was the one that the senior editors came to to ask questions when it came to any content so I came by the time I was editor-in-chief like I had, I didn't really have that kind of like, oh, you're a woman. Like, I didn't, I didn't deal with that. Just because, again, I came into it so, you know, lucky in that way of just the way I was positioned in the, at the magazine that, you know, like, even though I was an editor in chief, in many ways for the hip hop community, I was an editor in chief because they knew, like, don't mess with me me because <laughs> if not, you're not going to get in by a magazine. So I feel like that's what helped my journey not be very similar to a lot of some, some not even a lot, some other women's stories that heard that they felt they dealt with a lot of misogyny. I didn't, I didn't deal with that. I think the only time that I noticed it maybe came into play, and a little bit, was when I became editor-in-chief, some people were kind of like, oh, wait, now, like, now, now you're really the one making all the decisions, and I think maybe just, some men just have a problem with with women, so I would maybe notice the sort of like, I got to deal with the woman. Like you would kind of feel feel that like they just didn't like the fact that I would be like, nope, we're not putting, you know, we're not giving so and so a cover like that. But nothing really crazy or 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 um, outright. Like I luckily don't have any of those kind of crazy stories from those days because I think of the way I sort of came into the industry. Can you talk a little bit about your transition to Latina Magazine and what you were able to bring to that magazine based on all of those experiences that you built? Yeah, Latina Magazine was really fun. Um, I remember when I became editor-in-chief, my first uh, issue was with Jessica Alba, which was a really, I knew it was gonna piss off a lot of people because um, the internet, this is when the internet was becoming popular and there were all these fake quotes from Jessica denouncing her Latina, Latino heritage. And I just remember being like, is this true? Is this real? Perez Hilton was going in on her. Like he was always like posting these really horrible things about Jessica Alba. So I like went down like a rabbit hole on the internet and just like was just looking, looking, looking. I was like, I kind of feel like this isn't true. Like I feel like this is, this is, these are fake quotes. And so we reached out to her. Um, and, and she agreed to do the interview and I got to talk to her and basically prove that she, she was a proud Latina and that those quotes were um, fake. But that's basically, you know, going, coming into Latina, learning so much from, from Vibe, I, I wanted to continue that idea of just like doing different things that aren't necessarily, um, you know, especially with a culture like that where Latinas or Latinos in general are so marginalized in the mainstream um, um, media or we often see a lot of stereotypical um, representations so I wanted to make sure with the magazine that 
we broadened things a little bit more, like whether we did something like putting our first Latino Supreme Court Justice, Sonia Sotomayor, on the cover, to putting um, black Latinas on the cover, which had not been on the cover before I became editor-in-chief. Um, you know, a rising star like Selena Gomez, who no one had even heard of. She just was on a Disney show, but I felt like, gosh, like this girl seems like, you know, she has it, she's gonna be a star. So really just the same thing, just taking risks and doing things that, and they weren't really risks for me because to me, I was like, this is necessary. Like there's, I think our audience, this audience is thirsty to have real representations of who we really are as people. It might feel like risky because in the his, you know, the magazine had been around by the time I came on, um, I guess about maybe about 10 years or so. And they hadn't done a lot of the things that, that I started doing at the magazine, but so what, <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> So you go from the magazine world to I Am Other. Can you talk about that transition working with Pharrell Williams and the company? So that's been awesome. Um, Pharrell and I have been friends um, since my Vibe days, and he'd always been a fan of my work. And when he started I Am Other in 2011, he, uh, he invited me to come on, and he considers I Am Other a creative collective. It's like the umbrella company for all his ventures. And he presented the role as an opportunity to do all kinds of content. So up until now, up until then rather, I had you know just done magazines and done websites, and he was like, we well, you know, want to do movies and TV and we'll do videos and concerts. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, all right, like, can I do that? And he just sort of reminded me, like, you do content, like you, the, this, this is the same thing, it's just different mediums, like what's, what's the difference? So I was nervous, but that was also, why I felt like I needed to do it because it felt like a great opportunity and I figured, well, let me try it. If it doesn't work, I can always go back to magazines. I can always go back to writing. And um, it's been, I mean, it's been the best thing ever. And I really feel like my entire career really prepared me for, for um, for the, for the for this moment because I never thought I would do I, I didn't I never had aspirations to do a music video or to do a concert tour or even to do movies like they, these all these were all things that I was a fan of and saw from afar but unlike I had a really good friend Cheo Hodari Coker who's the uh, showrunner for Luke Cage on Netflix he was was one of our top journalists at Vibe and he always knew he wanted to be in movies and he was always talking about movies in the 90s and he would always tell me you'd make a great producer to I'd be like uh huh like that again unlike the magazine industry which to me it was in New York and that felt tangible movies was like I don't know what that even what are you talking about like that just sound that's la la land right like that's mm -hmm. literally some some other thing um, so it wasn't something that I necessarily was working towards. It just sort of happened. And then once I got the opportunity and I was able to sort of taste it, it just felt like the most natural thing in the world. So I think now would be a great time to take, check out a clip from one of the first collaborations, which was Happy, the music video. <laughs> like that video literally makes you happy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I, mean, I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah. So watching it, I was like, wow, I mean, it was really fun <laughs> to it's, put that together. When I was watching it the other day, just to refresh, it was weird because I got kind of emotional because I was like, man, everything's me so too. depressing <laughs> in the world right now. This makes me so happy. It was a hopeful time. But um, I mean, the story behind that video is so interesting because when the song was released, I heard that you know radio programmers were like, this isn't gonna be yeah, a hit, no. this is not we, the one. We told over and over again, all summer, it was like, it's not a hit, it's not a hit, it's not a hit. And then when we um, decided, I mean, literally it sold about maybe 100,000 copies before the video came out, and now it's like at 14 million <laughs> after the So I mean, this out. was like a moment where you, I, I'm wondering for you, as a, as a person who was transitioning in careers, was this a moment where you realized the power of the visual medium when you saw the power oh, of this video? So this was this was a career defining moment for me because um, when when I made the transition to work with with Pharrell, the first two years was really just was really quiet. Like we were just mostly focusing on him. Like he was in the studio working, doing stuff. So it wasn't like a whole lot going on. We did some content on our YouTube channel, but it was really after doing that video that even Pharrell was kind of like, "Hey, we need to <laughs> utilize your." skills as a storyteller, you need to just go and figure out our film and TV division and go go do that. But it was really after, after this that kind of was such an aha moment even for me personally because it reminded me like, oh wait, yeah, I'm 
storyteller. Like, this is what I need to be doing. I need but to focus on this. Because you were the one who suggested this walking and dancing. Yeah, well, concept. and again, I feel so weird <laughs> taking credit for that because, so Pharrell had a different idea for the video. Um, Cause like I said, all summer we're like, we should do a video cause everyone's telling us it's not a hit. We should do a video. Maybe that can help convince people. So he had a different idea. He wanted to do something um, really cool. I did do something in a black church. And then because the movie was such a hit, you know, it was like this huge, huge hit, Despicable Me Too. I wanted to figure out a way to connect the movie to the um, to the video in some way. And I remembered in the film when Happy plays, the lead character Groove re realizes that he's falling in love and he's so happy when the song's playing that he literally dances down the street. And I was like, Pharrell, you should just do what Groove does. Like, you should just do that, dance down the street. So that's why I feel weird taking any credit because it was there, it was right in front of our faces. But really, it was the directors. We are from LA, this French directing duo um, from Paris who came up with the 24-hour concept and really took it all the way there and had the amazing 24 hours of happy.com um, website idea where, I don't know if anyone's checked it out, but it, you will go down a rabbit hole. Like, if you just have it on, it literally is just 24 hours of, <laughs> of all those happiness <laughs> of happiness. And we've heard that, like, we've had people come, doctors come up to us and tell us that they've used it with, um, cancer patients to like lift their mood and they'll you know just kind of put it on because you really can't help but smile <laughs> when you see I you know, creepily looked people. out at the audience and saw people smiling while they were watching it's uh, true yeah, it makes it again it literally makes me happy to you know but it was such a joy to work on this project and we are from LA um, those guys I mean it was such it was so ambitious I just remember when I first got the treatment for it being so excited when I saw it 24 hours I was just like oh my gosh like what what like what do, wait what what do they want to do and and again it felt so crazy and be honest I, I didn't even know if that was logistically possible it, it sounded insane but I was like hey if they're down to try it then then I'm down to do it too like yeah. let's let's see what's up let's see if we can pull this off so from there we move to the first movie that you work on which is dope I'd love us to watch a clip of that film right now this is a scene that introduces us to life at the bottoms and introduces us to Dom a dope dealer played by ASAP Rocky so, I mean, you were a producer on this film and you were on set quite frequently. What did that look like day to day? What was it like being on the set and what were you up to? What were you doing? So, funny story about how this movie came about. So this, um, Pharrell's with WME and we had been obviously telling him we want to do movies. So um, his agent, Simon Faber, um, who's Canadian actually, <laughs> um, he, uh, he asked us to meet with Rick Famuyiwa. He was like, we have a writer director, he has this idea. And I just fell in love with the idea. He didn't have a script. He had like a little lookbook of a couple of images and I just fell in love with the idea and it felt like the perfect um, first project. So fast forward to, you know, we sign on to do it. Forrest Whitaker and his producing partner, Nick, um, uh, Nina Yang Bon Jovi, they raised the money to, you know, we decided to, we do the movie independently. So we negotiated and, um, for I was executive producer and we negotiated for me to be a co-producer. I wasn't really sure what that meant <laughs> in terms of how much I was gonna really be allowed to do stuff because even before Nina and Forrest came on, I had um, told, uh, uh, let me see, I think it was, yeah, I can't remember, can't remember how it all came back. But anyway, fast forward to, I had given notes to Rick on his script, which it was a perfect script. I had like very little notes. But um, when it came time to cast, I was like looking at casting tapes, definitely weighing in. But originally I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to set for the first week and go home, right? Not really knowing if someone was gonna put me in the corner and just tell me to stay out of the way. But I got to the first day of set um, and by day three, Nina pulled me to the side and she was like, look, you are such a natural. Please stay the entire time um, and help me with the this entire production. And I was so kind of like floored because I was like, she's a real producer <laughs> and she's asking me to stay on and sort of help and be here the whole time. So it was awesome. It was really an awesome experience. And I really feel that because of my background in magazines as an editor in chief, where you're working with all these crazy creative people and you're making sure that you kind of have your one singular vision and you stay on time and under budget and make sure everyone's sort of happy and, and, and feeling good about working people started coming to me on set and asking me questions and I'd be like, um, this, and I'd be like, oh, I guess hopefully <laughs> that's right. Um, but yeah, it was, it, and that was, that was it for me. That was like, oh, I'm so a producer now. <laughs> like, this is what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. This is awesome. 
So that was an independent film. The next film project, though, was a studio film. Was it a similar experience doing Hidden Figures? It was a similar experience in the sense that, well, one, I assumed that we were going to keep doing indie films and kind of build our credibility before we did a studio film, but this opportunity fell in our lap as well, too. I had a chance meeting, um, well, not really a chance meeting, but a meeting with Donna Gelati, the producer who optioned the book Hidden Figures, about another project. And then she just happened. I was like, oh, what else are you working on? And she starts telling me about Hidden Figures. I was like, how do we get on that project? <laughs> I want to be on that one. And again, like being on set every day for that and just participating in what we really did feel like could be such a huge hit at the box office because you had never seen anything like this before. You had never seen this level of female brilliance on the screen before. Add the fact that these were black women, um, a story, such an American story that had not been told, um, you know, a movie that uh, showed women in STEM, which are obviously very underrepresented. So it was, it felt very gratifying to be able to tell, so you felt the energy on set. Like everybody on set was very like, this is important. Like, let's make sure we don't mess this up. <laughs> like, let's, let's get this right because this is, it's, it's just, it's, it was a story that needed to be told. So let's take a look at a clip from Hidden Figures. It's one of my favorite scenes when Catherine sits in on a closed door Congress meeting where she's asked to calculate trajectory and landing points for John Glenn's capsule. So, I mean, this the success of Hidden Figures was astronomical. Not like not to be <laughs> my only scientific terminology. Um, and it was, it was kind of considered a first, right? A f one of the first ever films to feature three black female leads that achieved this type of box office success as well as critical success, as well as award success. You're now working on a film about a young black female rapper. I think, is this the first biopic of a female rapper yeah. ever to be done? Yeah, it's Roxanne, the, it's the, Roxanne. Yeah. Um, what is it, yeah, I think that does deserve <laughs> applause. Thank you for whoever is applauding for that. <laughs> I'm curious about how you're able to convince the powers that be that these firsts are the things that they need to invest in, whether it be financiers, distributors, studios, whoever. Well, we actually started um, working on or, uh, Roxanne, Roxanne right after um, the success of Dope. Um, or actually right when we were about to um, get, get ready to do that. So it was actually before um, uh, Hidden Figures that we started kind of toying around with this idea. I think. I think a lot of, I'm not sure how to answer the question. I think a lot of it's just persistence, <laughs> and like, or maybe a prior track record, or just being really passionate and convincing. The fact to have a, a celebrity producing partner is very helpful, um, given Pharrell's track record and sort of, um, you know, he's not going to put his name on something unless he really believes in it. So that's sort of helped his sort of 20 plus, you know, um, year in music and being transferring it over to Hollywood has, has been really helpful. And then I think for me, I, I just keep going for stories that I just feel like need to be told, right? Like so often we hear, you know, we've been hearing for the longest time though about Hollywood not being diverse, not being um, uh, willing to tell these stories. And, and, uh, and a lot of people will be like, oh, Hollywood's racist. I don't know if I'm necessarily gonna come out and say that. I think it has more to do with the fact that people green light what they know, what they're familiar with. Dope actually, before we decided to do it independently, um, was taken around to all the studios and nobody you know wanted to touch it nobody wanted to do the do the movie and I think that partly was just because they didn't understand what it was because I grew up you know a, a smart girl in the hood like it was very familiar to me so even before there was a script I was like oh of course this is a story that not only resonates with me but it's going to have universal universal appeal because who doesn't identify with the idea of not letting your environment define who you are um, so I think, you know, and then with obviously, you know, Hidden Figures, um, the success of that, by the time when we decided to go and raise the money to do Roxanne, we're coming, you know, like it kind of everything all sort of fell into place. So I think, I think people just trust the team, which is why we've been able to get, um, stuff done. But we never even took out Roxanne to the, to the town. We knew nobody was going to make that movie. We didn't even bother, especially after, you know, going out with dope and no one got it until they saw it. Then we had everybody bid on the same people who passed on the movie bid, bid on the movie to buy it, which was very surreal. But yeah, with Roxanne, two reasons. One, we knew nobody was going to understand it, um, because Roxanne, um, Shantae wasn't, uh, you know, 
unfortunate circumstances in her life, which you'll see in the movie when it comes out, prevented her from having a bigger career. So she's not a name that most people know, so we knew that's why people would say no. And then the other reason was, even though we were like, okay, if for some reason somebody does wanna make this movie, they're gonna approach it a very Hollywood way, and they're gonna make us put someone like Zendaya, who I love, as the lead role, but she's so not Roxanne Chante. We wanted an unknown. We wanted someone that you didn't, we wanted someone that really looked like Chante. Zendaya does not look like Chante. And we wanted someone that just had a clean sort of slate so that you can really, when you watch this film, you can really kind of like just absorb yourself into this character because it's such a roller coaster, a very emotional role for such a young girl because her life, Roxanne Chante's life was crazy. It was crazy. Kind of like what you did with Shamik Moore as well, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah, Shamik, Who same thing. We, want, we wanted an unknown for that, you know, the same Star thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, Shamik was, you know, he. When I remember seeing his audition tape, and I might have even started crying, because I was like, yes, this is our <laughs> Malcolm, you know? But same thing, too. We did not want an established um, actor for that role. So at this point, we're gonna turn it over to the audience. There are going to be two volunteers walking around with microphones, and you can just raise your hand, and they will come to you, and you can ask a question. And please make it a question and not a statement. Although we love statements, we are welcoming questions today. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Um, just a quick question. I was just wondering, as in Hollywood, you have many challenges as whether it be a woman, as a producer, as a content creator. What would you say one of the biggest challenges as specifically as a producer every single day you would have to wake up and have to deal with? I know that might be a little bit broad because yeah, this is no, not an easy industry. No, I think, I think it has to do with just, we need more diversity in executives in Hollywood, you know, making, des making decisions. I think that's probably the toughest thing because even with, we have two projects that we sold this year to studios. We have um, a musical um, called Atlantis that we sold to 20th Century Fox, and we just sold a horror movie to Warner Brothers. So very excited and lucky that we, you know, we got these sold. Even still, I'm still not ner I guess nervous, yes, but just very concerned about making sure, like, because these are both stories that aren't, you know, they're with people of color, they're, you know, they have, there's a big um, music component to them, and I know that they're gonna need a lot of hand-holding and not just, not maybe not so much in the creation of it, because I think we got that, but more when it comes to the marketing and promotion. I think that's where we've been really, um, you know, I think about that kind of keeps me up <laughs> at night, just thinking about like, I want to be able to come up with the ideas and sort of hand it to the marketing department just to, you know, I know they want to do their traditional things and how they do stuff, but really um, kind of just showing them a different way to think about it because Hollywood does like just to check boxes and do yeah. things in a traditional way. It's my frustration with the movie Dope. We're proud of what it did at the box office, but um, they did not listen to us for any of the marketing stuff that we wanted to do, which is why when it came to Hidden Figures, I was like, where are the marketing people at Fox? I need to make them my best friends. And Pharrell and I took them out to lunch and we really kind of like talked about strategy. And they were brilliant as well. They had their own ideas, but they really listened to us, which is why um, we did this huge um, block party concert for TIFF last year, which you know, the, the festival had never done a big music concert like that before Fox, um, 20th Century Fox had never done anything like that. Um, so I think that's usually, that's kind of my now challenge that I'm like, okay, we're, we're moving and grooving. People are like, you know, they're buying our ideas. We have two projects set up a studio, which is like phenomenal. I'm so excited, but I'm like, I can't let them mess the, up the marketing and yeah. promotion of this film because I, like I said, I, who knows if it would have been a bigger film dope if they had listened to us, but that's like my fear now that I'm like, you, 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 you guys gotta let us, you know, so much so that in our deals, we've actually asked for some marketing money um, ourselves to just kind of be able to do it on our own. One more, if that's okay. Um, I'm a media production student, and as you being an editor-in-chief, and you talk about how you should expose yourself to different, as many as things as possible, like theater and museums, I admire Anna Winthor a lot, because she says almost the exact same things as she cares about your, there's one, there's one component to it where she'll look at your education background, but she's more important who you are as a person. So in this industry, would you say versatility is 
important and thought and ideas as well as like what you can do as like as skill and like yeah absolutely you, i mean versatility is important i think just being open in general like you can have your opinions and your expertise of how something should or shouldn't be but being open and and being willing to see something through someone else's eyes or or experience things that maybe you're not used to experiencing like you know whether it's theater or you know a play or whatever those things are but i do think that whatever your craft is it's great to know it like inside and out backwards and frontwards 100 percent. but in addition to that craft you know like the like fashion designers or directors whatever they they know their craft but then in order to inform their craft they know all these other things or have, you know take the time to expose themselves to all these other different worlds because that's what's gonna make them a better director, a better editor, a better writer. So, absolutely. Yeah. We have a question up there. Hi, Hi. how are you? <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, so, I wanted to ask you, um, what advice would you give to someone who is similarly interested in making the transition from journalism to film and TV production? And what kind of skills, like you were saying, um, from being an editor in chief and being on set, what other kinds of skills are the most transferable from each? Oh, gosh, I mean, I think the ability to, to be a leader, um, and I always consider the, the best, best thing a leader can have is not just being willing to open, open to listen to your team, but being decisive. That's what I find, to be honest, like, probably the biggest hurdle for a lot of people when they're just making transitions over. Like, they're like, oh my God, like, this is a new thing. I don't know what the decision is. Just be decisive, make the decision. If it ends up being the wrong decision, oh well, you learn from it, you move on. But I think in order to really be able to um, to do it easily, like, I, I think the, the fear of like, oh my God, I'm gonna make a wrong decision, you have to let that go and just be decisive in those, in. Um, when you, when you are making the transition, being like, all right, well now I'm gonna make a short film and just see what this is, just make it. And don't worry about it being perfect or worrying, worrying about it being like, you know, I need these many people, I hope these many people see it or whatever it is. It's like, you just have to make stuff. You just have to just be decisive when you're making it, not worry about making mistakes because even the mistakes you can learn from. Um, right over there. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure uh, um, all of us understand exactly what um, it entails being a producer on something like Happy. Can you uh, walk us through the kinds of responsibilities you'd have on a shoot like that? Yeah, well, some okay, so it's, it's very similar to a film in the sense that, like, um, you know, a producer may come up with an idea, like, within that case, it was, it was um, you know, sort of having, bringing that idea to Pharrell, but then it was picking the director, and once we pick the director, having a say in the cin cinematographer, um, the casting director, looking at all the people we were casting, making sure that uh, you know we were gonna have food at set, like just all the things that go involved into sort of making that production run smoothly, you're involved in. Like in many ways, you know, I think producer in general, just even on a film, is lots of times people are like, what does the producer do? And sometimes I'm like, well, you know, at the Academy Awards when Best Picture wins, <laughs> who is accepting the award? It's the producer because the producer is the one that's actually bringing all these people together and making sure that you know what we set out to do is what's done. Did you give feedback as the shoot was being made? Do you give feedback? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Like I remember, um, uh, you know, like for example, you're you're literally being like you're kind of like a, a ghost, and you know, you, you want to let the creative people do what they want to do. You don't want to be too much in the way when the directors when stuff is going on. But I remember in the happy video, you know, I'm looking at the monitor as well as we're walking and stuff. And then, you know, sometimes you'd see somebody like, wait, what did they just do? Like, no, 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 tell them, <laughs> tell them, to, you know, they can't do that. So sure, you step in. But you also want to be very mindful of, you know, letting the create, like I said, you don't, you don't want to be telling the director how to do their job, right? Because that's, again, going back to being a leader. You've made the decision, you hired these directors, you let them do what they do, unless you see something that feels a little bit like, oh wait, that's not, that doesn't feel right. Question up above. Hello. Um, Hi. Hello. Uh, taking in consider, into consideration that you are coming from an independent uh, in, uh, side of the industry, I was thinking that it uh, is a big challenge try to go from independent to the studio film industry. So 
I would like to know if you can share with us what is your strategy as a producer, for example, when you, you think, okay, I have a great pro, uh, project. As a producer, you as a mm -hmm. chef, for example, you mm -hmm. have to prepare that recipe with the best ingredients, best actors, locations, ideas, etc. So you are ready. So what kind? Of, what is the package finally that you present to the studios? You, for example, in the me, uh, main industry, you present a HD photo animatic, and yeah. you show, for example, 30 seconds or a one minute of an idea, for example, to give the vibe, the energy yeah. about the, what, what do you present as a package? So it, we did it two different ways. I'll tell you like on Atlantis, the musical that we sold, we chose the writer um, and the director and we kind of had like a loose uh, treatment idea of kind of what the script would be, or what the story would be and that's how we went to the studios and presented it. With the horror movie, um, Survive the Night, that we took to Warner Brothers, we actually had a lookbook um, with images and pictures that would give the sort of vibe of what we were going for. We had, um, again, the sort of a loose treatment of all the characters. We even put um, pictures of actors that we thought would be great for all the roles and just gave them like an overall vibe of it. So that was for that, um, for, you know, those are two studio films. For um, the independent stuff, um, that was, we didn't necessarily go that in deep because we, um, we had investors that were already ready to kind of do whatever project um, you know, we wanted to do, so we just more told them the idea. But I think in general, I, I think, and especially just doing this twice this year in Hollywood, the more visual that you can get, I think is better because it helps them sort of understand <laughs> what it is that you're trying to do. So I think when you have the images and obviously having a very tight story, sort of, you know, an idea of act one, act two, act three, and this is kind of what, what happens. I think that's the best way to package it. Um, and then, you know, if you have your writer and your director, obviously, as already chosen. And then sometimes if there is an actor that's already attached, that can be helpful. But to me, the best way to sort of package and sell a film, whether it is to a studio or even to potential investors, is to have the sort of lookbook um, with the images of kind of what the, the vibe of the film will be. Right over here. Hi, Mimi. Hi. Uh, from working at Vibe to uh, you know be get, being a media producer on films, I noticed that you took a lot of big risks, you know, in putting, let's say, lesser-known artists on your magazine to right. uh, producing films like Dope that maybe you know producers w other producers wouldn't want to pick up. Right. And we talked about you talked about you know films that were successful. Can you talk about uh, other products that maybe failed because you know as creators. We try and try again, and we never talk about you know the a thousand projects that not ne we, that don't necessarily make it. Right. Uh, what did you learn from these? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I I think I think I, and I touched upon it a little bit before. Like even the things that are mistakes aren't really mistakes because I think you need, you know, happy was basically it, it was that story is really about, I always say it's about failure, determination, and authenticity because Happy originally, this, well, going back to the song, right, Pharrell creating a song, he literally created nine songs beforehand for this one scene and they all got rejected and he just kept going, kept going. So I think for me, thinking back on like some projects that maybe, you know, um, like right now we have some things in development that people are just not getting, <laughs> you know, and it's so clear to me, I'm like this, I don't understand why can't we sell this, you know? But I, I think, you know, it's it's not an easy thing when rejection happens or failure or, or, or things, but it, it can't, we can't allow those things to stop us from, from trying because it's with usually those ideas that nobody gets are the ones that end up being the most successful because, you know, especially if you tap into something great, um, you know that there's an, there's an audience for it. So I th I'm trying to think of like times when, you know, like I said, this now I'm, actively going to a project that I know that I feel like would be great, but people aren't getting. So that's always frustrating, and you just try to not, um, you know, try not to get depressed <laughs> about it, or not to get frustrated, and just, you know, if you really believe in something, you just have to keep going. Because sometimes I think it's a trick from whatever, if you believe in God, or if you just believe in the universe, however you want to phrase it. But sometimes I feel like it's almost like, 
the universe is trying to tell you, like, do you really want to do this project? Because we're going to make it really hard for you and see if you really, really want to do this. We're going to throw all these hurdles at you and see if you, if you, if you, uh, you know, stay on course, and that means you really want to do it. But if you start believing the noise and being like, gosh, like no one's really getting this. All right, forget it. Never mind. That to me is a disappointment because then it means that maybe you know you weren't, you didn't really believe in the project. So, we have time for one last question. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is like, as a person who also um, like is um, passionate about creating content and creating creative content, um, when you when you have an initial idea, how do you go about nurturing that idea into something that's like a complete film or a complete music video, things like that? I have explain a, that. I feel like I have over you know now almost twenty five years of being you know a creative. I I feel like I have a really good tight circle of people that I trust um, and that I value their opinion. So it obviously starts with me, how I feel, right? Like if I feel butterflies and get really excited, that's usually a good sign. And then I like go test it out. And some of these people I work with, some people, old vibe executives that I haven't worked with in, <laughs> in 20 years or whatever, that I'm still really good friends with, I'll ask them and I'll just sort of go around. And I think that is another thing as creatives is really important that ultimately we're the ones doing the work and it's, you know, it's our project to, either fail at or <laughs> succeed at, but when you have a nice tight circle of other creatives and people that you trust, and, and that and doesn't even say I have to just be creative, just people that you trust their taste and their tone and just their opinion, that to me has always been sort of the best, um, just best way to test out stuff and just get a feel for it. And sometimes, even if they don't agree, and I'm not looking for everybody to agree on it, I'm just, I just wanna hear what they think because sometimes in something that they say, they might think something's crazy, but in their criticism of it might make me think of something like, oh, okay, so you know what, maybe I need to tweak it a little bit and do this. So, you know, and that's why it's important to have people around you that all don't think the same, right? Like that's why that diversity comes in really handy so that you are able to utilize um, all these different perspectives to, to inform your work and make it better. Thank you. Uh, Thank I actually you. got the notice that we have time for one last question, and I don't know who got the mic. Do you know? I know there's a hand over here that's been up for a while. Oh. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's the war of the mics. Okay. <laughs> oh, we have time? Okay, so we can okay. do both? Okay, great. So somebody also over there, just an FYI. Okay. Okay, so does industries like really, I feel like that like when I'm in school, like I feel like that like it's really competitive. How did you deal with like, did it ever bring you down? Like did you ever feel like that? Like did you ever compare yourself? And yeah. just like that feeling, you know, like. No, that, yeah. that, that, and I'm glad you asked that question because I do think um, I'm always really disappointed when I see people who act in that very competitive, cutthroat, you know, I don't know, come over and like ruin your work and so whatever it is, right? Like those those people that are like crazy, right? That do that sort of stuff. That's always saddens me because it's so not necessarily, I, and it's, not, it's so not necessary. I, I really believe the way I've sort of dealt with competition or people being whatever, easier said than done, but this is just sort of what I, how I always do it is I really try to ignore them <laughs> as much as possible and really take a lot of comfort in the fact that my individuality, who I am as a person, is unlike anyone else. And I don't have to be worried. I don't have to be worried if I hear that uh, someone else is maybe doing um, something that might be similar to mine. Because in my head, I'm like, you're not gonna do it like how I'm gonna do it. So I'm not, I'm not gonna even be worried about it. But that takes time, you know? That's not something easy that like all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like not worried about the competition. It takes time, so don't worry about it so much now. But just, if anything, just Build, build the things or, or take comfort in the things that make you uniquely you, right? The things that are, you know, the things that make you who you are, the things that nobody else has had, the, your perspective, like take a lot of comfort and confidence in that. And I think that's what will help you sort of tune out the haters and tune out all the crazy competitive people and just just not get wrapped up, you know, um, in what it is that they're doing. And there's there's a quote I don't know where it came from, but it says um, I've heard like it's none of my business what people think of me. Something to you know have in the back of your brain all the time. I I, I always try to, you know, they say that you're not supposed to read you know, reviews and all that sort of stuff. And I do. I'm like, you know, I look at all that. But I've learned over the years that you can't get too happy 
when they say great things so that when they say the horrible things, you're not affected. You know, like they just, you just look at the stuff for what it is, but none of that means anything. What, what matters most is how you feel about your projects and it, what matters is, you know, did you achieve your goals? Did you set out to do, you know, were you successful in what it is that you set out to do? And a lot of that is just gonna come from who you are as an individual and, you know, individuality is, you know, is important and, and that will help you get through all your, your roller coaster <laughs> that you go through right now, those emotions, like it's noise, just tune it out. Last question. Hi. Uh, hello, um, my name is Magda. Hi. And this question is kind of for both of you. Um, uh, for Amanda as a writer, and Mimi as you as a producer. I'm wondering, um, when it comes to looking for collaborators, partners with your projects, um, what are you looking for, and how do you go about finding those individuals? Uh, sure, I feel like I'm a little bit more new to this. Um, I think uh, every project is very different, and so I, I generally kind of, I have some certain people that are kind of my solids that are always kind of consistently there and who kind of understand my vision no matter what the different project is, and they're really amazing people to have around me just because they are able to bring certain things to life all the time. But then in other cases, I have to switch it up because the project changes. I like to switch mediums a lot of the time. Um, and I think in terms of how I find those folks, again, I think the life experience piece is key because I'm always out there and meeting people. There are people that I kind of keep in the back of my head all the time of like, oh, this person's really brilliant in this way. I saw this person's uh, ability to direct through this play. I saw this person's set design in this way. I saw this. Um, and then if I don't know the people, asking those that I trust for referrals is really important as well too. And then the building of the relationship, I think it's really important to know who you are and how you work before you get into a collaboration so you can be honest with folks up front. Um, I've had a, quite a number of collaborations fall apart because we weren't honest about the ways that we work together and how that probably wasn't gonna work to, like for us as a team. Um, but when I have been honest and when I have been able to, to be direct with somebody and they were direct with me about the different ways that we work and what we see for this particular project, magic is able to happen. Um, I think when you find people that you work with really well, keep them and treat them really well and appreciate them and, uh, and uh, celebrate them as much as possible, support their other projects as well too because that brilliance you wanna keep around you. I had the most beautiful experience um, I just closed my play last week, and the director of that play is somebody that I will, Nigel Sean Williams, who I will champion for the rest of my life because his brilliance was so overwhelming, I couldn't believe what he did with my words. And so that's now, whether he wants to be or not, he's in my inner circle. <laughs> he is now here, and um, yeah, I just think celebrating the geniuses around you is really important because they're gonna feel that and they're gonna keep connecting you to other geniuses as well too. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more, and the only thing I'll add is that I think both Pharrell and I, and now, um, because all of our movies have been with other other producers, we've we've collaborated. I think for us, we're always looking for people that feel very um, passionate about about work, um, and that we feel that we can learn something from them. That they're gonna uh, sort of, you know, because we're new. You know, we've only done now well three movies now. Well, one one doesn't come out till next year, but. We're, we're very clear on the fact that we still have a lot, of learn, a lot to learn in the industry, so we're just looking for people always to be like, all right, you know, who, can we, who can we collaborate with, who can we learn from, and who can we just create great work together. And because our work is so specific, because we, again, it's, diversity is really important to us, and, and making sure that we're bringing unique characters to the screen, we just wanna make sure that the people that we align ourselves with have the same sort of, um, you know, uh, that really believe in it the way we do and not just like, oh, this is a hot trend right now, let's jump on this. It's like, no, they really are, are championing, it, championing it in a way that is um, real and true. It's amazing, that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much, Mimi, thank this was you. awesome. You were awesome, Amanda, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to all of you, thank you. And everyone, go see Roxanne, Roxanne, when it comes out. Yay. I'm so excited to see it, and thank you all for being here. Thank you.